Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. I want to be speaking on the characteristics of the kingdom. And um, this session may seem to be not too critical, but I think it is probably the most important aspect of application of the concept of the kingdom that we need to study in. Basically, we're going to be talking about understanding the focus that Jesus had, why he taught so much and focus on this subject of kingdom life. And uh, let's begin with a few thoughts. Number one, write it down please. God's original plan was never religion. And that's a concept that we need to just clear in our minds. That's really a paradigm shift. Because we are all religious people. And I'm talking about everybody. Buddhists. Muslims, Hindus, Confucius, Scientologists, Baha'i faith, the Moonies, Unification Church. Yeah, there's a whole lot of religions, and I better throw in the part Christianity, because Christianity has become just like all the others. It's one massive, complicated, ritualistic, religious experience. Religion is from the word which means to search. So religion is a, is a description you give of a person participating in a search. So religion is an activity of searching. And that is why religion is so overbearing. It's, it's a search. You're trying to find something. So Christians are also being reduced to a search. That's why we're still not we. I used to be one of them. I'm no longer a Christian. <laughs> I'm now a citizen. We'll talk about that in a minute. But religion makes you strive to please your deity. Uh, religion makes you strive to appease your deity. And these are important statements I'm making because they are so subtle. We have become just like almost any other religion in the world. We do things so God could like us. That's what other religions do or are afraid to do. They want to appease the deity. Isn't it strange that while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you, so how, how can you try to appease him? But yet religion does that. Christianity, the religion Christianity, is a religion of keeping laws. It's a religion of keeping expectations laid down by an organization called whatever your denomination is. That's what Christianity has become to most people. Uh, this is why Christians are always tired. They're tired working so hard to not break laws. Suppose you spend the rest of your life living in your country Focusing on not breaking any law. How could you enjoy living in that country? Citizenship is not the focus on keeping laws. If you are a citizen of your country, you enjoy your country. You enjoy the environment. You enjoy the resources. You enjoy the atmosphere, you enjoy the culture, you enjoy the food, you enjoy the, the freedom to walk on, on the park or to go on the beach or to go swimming or, or to go and watch a game. I mean, you enjoy your citizenship. You don't focus on, I wonder which law I'm breaking now. Religion makes you tired. God's plan was never religion. Secondly, God's plan was for you always to rule. Always rulership is on his mind. Thirdly, your destiny is king dominion. These are concepts you need to get into your thought patterns. Fourthly, 
the purpose of God is Christ in Christ rather was to restore his kingdom on earth that's why God sent Christ was to restore the kingdom on earth and then fourthly every man is searching for kingdom dominion now this statement is loaded every man is searching for kingdom dominion in other words every man is looking for power over his environment please write this statement down Christianity is a religion religion does not give you power over your environment religion gives you the tolerance to endure the circumstances religion also gives you comfort in the midst of your tribulation your trials it, it, it makes you accept your environment without the prospect of changing it but the kingdom is different God intended for you and I to be dominators of our environment and I want to stress this power bit every human being in the world is looking for power every human being 6.2 billion of them whether they live under a bridge or they live in a palace they have the same desire they both want power am I right about that be honest what do you really want tell the truth and don't come to me with all that religious garbage about you want to be humble and you want to you know just serve the Lord no you want power and don't be ashamed of that desire as a matter of fact if you don't want power something's wrong with you some of y'all look shocked already I ain't started yet power motivates everything you do right now I can prove it power motivates you right now power motivates everybody that's why there's corruption in the world the corruption is not the problem corruption is activity that the individual participates in with the prospect of getting power I want to prove it again you want power and we got to settle this issue because if you don't settle this you're going to keep denying the truth about yourself you want power why is it every young person's dream even the man sleeping in the gutter on a cardboard box right now his dream is to be a millionaire at 40 why do all of us think that now we don't tell everybody that but we think that anybody never thought that don't lie all of you dreamt of being a millionaire is that true come on, hold your hand up if you ever dreamt that hold your hand up please if you ever thought of that hold your hand up keep them up keep them up keep them up obey me turn us up lying lift your hand up I'm, I'm disappointed oh three millionaire okay instead of one millionaire yeah we all want a lot of money let me tell you why let me tell you why we don't want money it's not money we want we want what money promises us money promises us power power to wear what we want drive what we want live where we want eat anything we want buy what we want go where we want stay as long as we want play the sport we want I mean just do anything we want we want the power why do you try to be famous and don't lie everybody wants to be famous because it's not fame you want what fame gives you is what influence and influence is what power so that's what you want so you try to become a good singer a great basketball player a great hockey player a great football player a great preacher same issue why it's not the activity it's what it promises you what does it promise you power
Do you know why you want power? Because it's natural. You know, I'm going to say this to you. I have so much to say to you, but you can't take it now. But I'll say this much. What was the last thing Christ promised you? Last promise. It's found in Acts chapter 1. He knows just what you're looking for. He promised you power. Not just power, but power over circumstances. He said, I give you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Why? Because he knows that's what you want. It's power. Are we selling this issue yet? No, we still ain't selling. Some of y'all still ain't get it. I can see it. Power. Do you know why the poor people like Jesus and didn't like the Pharisees? Here's something crazy. Do you know why the rich people love Jesus and didn't like the Pharisees? Because the Pharisees and Sadducees represented religion. Remember now, religion doesn't give you power. It gives you toleration. <laughs> it teaches you to tolerate your circumstances that you can't control. As religion does. So religion says, it's the Lord's will for you to be like this. That's religion. So it explains why you shouldn't control your environment. But here comes this 30-year-old rabbi from this little town in Nazareth and he has a message that's not religious. He's preaching this king dominion. He's preaching ruler domination. Come on, let's say it. Don't, don't get too spiritual about the word. King means ruler and dom is domination. So a kingdom is a ruler that dominates. He says you were born to be in a rulership dominion position. When the people heard that, they said, my God, you mean we could take control of our circumstances? So they followed him by the thousands. Why? He appealed to what their passion was. And every one of you get it. He appealed to their desire for power. And then he then just demonstrated it and that made it worse. Because they didn't only hear him say you're going to have power. But now he said getting rid of disease they couldn't get rid of for years. Here's a guy sick for 38 years laying on a mat. And every time he tried to get up, people run before him. I mean, the guy is what? Helpless. His circumstances controls him. And he lays on a mat. And the mat becomes his prison. Here comes Jesus. And the Bible says he preached the kingdom of God. And then he told the man, what can I do for you? And the man says, I was laying here. I tried to get up. I can't get in. And Jesus says, well, what do you want? He says, I want to be healed. He said, good. Take your mat up and start carrying your mat. Don't let your mat carry you. Y'all talk to me. Clap. That's a good place to clap. Come on. What did he give the man? Power. Lepers, man. When you had leprosy, you had to tie a bell around your neck or a bell around your feet. A cow bell. Just like a cow. When you were leprosy, you tie a bell around your neck. They put you outside the city. You couldn't come in. And whenever you came close to a human, you would ring the bell so they would know you are leprous and therefore you were literally an outcast. You were, you, were, uh, you were not able to socialize with the community. So to be a leper was to be an isolationist experience. Out of the community. Christ meets these ten lepers in their own little, you know, uh, isolation little colony and he says, you guys need to go back to your family. I can imagine them saying them, but we cannot control our circumstances. So he gives them what? Power. He takes away their leprosy. Gives them power back. All right. If we don't get this right, we can keep missing the kingdom. Tell your neighbor, I want power. Say it loud. 
Do you know why you get ulcers, high blood pressure? You get all kinds of skin disease. Do you know why you got cysts growing in your womb? You got lumps in your breast and you got all kinds of problems in your sexual organs, brother. Do you know why you got eye problems and, and all kinds of chest problems and, your, and your, your arteries messed up? Do you know why you get some attention, your neck so tight and your back aching? Do you know why you sick? You sick because you ain't got no power. Let me explain what I mean. Nothing makes you more depressed and frustrated than not being able to pay your bills. The bank controls our lives. They control the car. They control the house. They control how much groceries you can buy because you got to split the salary up into payment for the house and for the food. And sometimes you got to cut down the amount of food you eat because you got to pay more than one person that you may create a bill with. And sometimes you take home stuff that don't belong to you because it belongs to somebody else. You ever heard this? My paycheck gone before I received it. That's common. What does that mean? Other people control your lives. That's why you want to be a millionaire, hey. Come on. And so what do you get? You got worry. What is worry? Stress. Dr. Chris will tell you here this morning, scientifically proven, 97% of all disease is caused by stress. What is stress? Worry. What is worry? Concern about circumstances you can't change. Why do you think Jesus promised us authority over sickness and disease? He says it's kingdom. The kingdom gives you power over circumstances. What? That's what you want. And it goes all the way back to your original assignment, isn't it? Genesis 126, you know it very well, huh? What does it say? And God said, let us make man in our own image and in our likeness. Next statement. Let him have dominion over what? Fish, birds, trees, plants, creeps all on the earth he says you were created to dominate the environment kingdom is rulership over the environment and whenever you cannot do that then you become depressed oppressed suppressed and compressed and that's why he came to set us free power how many of you could think of some things you want to do right now but you can't do it because you ain't got the resources let me see your hands now how do you feel about that thing frustrated aren't you you want to finish that church man that frustration is you ain't got what it takes the resources you got no power over the circumstances then you go to the bank and then they start dictating the terms now you are under two prisons the worry now the stress then if they do give you the loan, <laughs> they add interest to that, and then they put a little note. This can be called in on demand. That's prison. So the Bible says the borrower is what? He's a slave. It's dominion. You were not created to be dominated like that. You created to dominate. And so the kingdom of God comes to restore that dominion. This other statement here, the destiny of king dominion. Uh, is, is so important because <clears throat> power is what the kingdom promises. Now, I want to show you how the kingdom works. Very important here. Uh, Daniel chapter 7. Some of you never read these before in your life, so please write these down. Matter of fact, we think that the Bible really is a deep book. The Bible is a very simple book. I'm going to show you a couple of scriptures of who the kingdom was designed for. All right? But remember now, we are reading the Old Testament. Some of you think the kingdom of God is a New Testament subject. No, it's as old as Genesis 1.26. But here we see Daniel. Daniel got a view of the future of mankind. Remember, he got the revelations about the future. And here's what Daniel saw in Daniel 7, verse 17 and 18. He says, But the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever, forever and ever. That's found in Daniel. You should read the whole passage, get the context, it's beautiful. He's talking about when the Messiah comes, he will create a nation of saints, and then Daniel says, the saints of the Most High God will do what? I can't hear you. Say it loud. Possess what? Not a religion. They'll possess the kingdom. How long? How long is forever? That means you cannot stay in heaven if that statement is true. 
Because ain't no rulership in heaven for you. Check the Bible. No one, no human rules in heaven. There ain't no room there for you to rule. That place already under rulership. What is unruly is earth. He says, that is your destiny. The next statement I found very interesting. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 7. Eh? One that we read last night. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from this time on and forever. When Christ comes, he says, he will bring what? A government. We did it last night. But look, look at what it says about the government. It says, the government shall increase and it shall never stop increasing. And then it says, he will uphold his government through what? Justice and righteousness. Now, write the word uphold down. Don't, that's not a... It's not a complicated word, but you've got to know what it means. The word uphold means to maintain or to, to function by. Very important word. To uphold means to maintain or to function by. So when you put that meaning in there, the verse changes. It says, this kingdom that he will have, he shall maintain it and it shall function by two things. Justice and righteousness. Write the word justice down. The word justice is not a religious word. It's a legal word from the courts. And every time you read the Old Testament or the New Testament, and you see the word kingdom mentioned, it always has the word either next to it or not too far from it, the word justice. It says, and he will rule with justice. You ever read that in the Bible? All through the Bible. He will rule with justice. Everybody say justice. justice. Say it loud. Justice. Say it loud. Justice. Write the word justice down. You got it down? The word means, ready for this? It means, <laughs> I love it. It means rights. R-I-G-H-T-S. This is important revelation. He says this kingdom will not function on feelings. Religion deals with feelings. Religion deals with emotions. Religion makes you hucka, 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 hucka. Religion makes you fall in the spirit and religion makes you dance and religion makes you feel the anointing none of that gets you anything from god this kingdom doesn't function on feeling nor emotion it functions on what rights why it's a literal government when you go into the courtroom friends to get something in the court system and you stand there in that witness box and the judge begins to talk about your case and your lawyer presents your evidence. And then you begin to witness. Now, here you are in the courtroom. You ever seen this? And you begin to break down and cry. You go, but judge. Do you know what the judge does? The judge stops the court. He says, stop. Uh, we will now take a break for 15 minutes. Please go and compose yourself and come back. Why? This is not a place for tears. This is a place for rights. And rights are obtained by evidence of legitimacy. Man, you all ain't listening to me. In other words, the reason why your prayers ain't answered yet, you've been praying for some things for a long time, is because you think God listened to you because you come with a funny sound. Oh, Lord. Yes. God said, look, this is a legal kingdom. you got to bring rights to me. Do you have a right to what you're asking for? It's kingdom thinking. Let me tell you something. Listen carefully. And this is going to blow some of your religious minds. An all night prayer meeting could do nothing if you don't understand kingdom. Hanging around the courtroom all night does not bring the judgment in your favor. I finished my case. You can, you can stay in the front of the courtroom for three days. And in three days, the judge said, what are you doing here? You got any evidence? Any new evidence? Do you have a right to claim what you're demanding? Look at that. He says his kingdom will operate on rights and righteousness. Write the word righteousness down. Very important. Why is this word always mentioned next to the kingdom? Seek the kingdom and its righteousness. Righteousness means, write it down, it means right 
relating. It means proper positioning. Oh man. Look at that verse. He said this kingdom will function on two things. If you are positioned properly, you can demand any rights that's yours. That's the way the kingdom works. So if you are out of position, God don't even ask for nothing. Let me tell you something. You remember when Christ says, if you come and bring your petition before the king, and while you present your petition, you remember that someone has ought against you. He said, don't try to present that. Why? You are not rightly related. <laughs> I'm so excited about living, brother. Because I tapped into the secret of the kingdom. That's why Christ called it a secret. The secret of the kingdom is not your, your emotional crying, snot nose, running, moaning, altar, weeping, religion. The most frustrated people on planet earth are religious people. You might be sitting next to one of them. They are frustrated. And if they are honest, they'll tell you they're frustrated. Now they put on a show for a couple hours every Sunday. But they're frustrated because the life ain't working. Your life ain't working. Why? Because religion deals with feelings. But a kingdom is a government with a legal entity. You need to go read the Bible all over again, see? There was a woman sitting in a religious organization for many years. You all, you all, you all remember this woman. She's an interesting woman. She was sick. She couldn't bend, bend up. She was bent over. She was sick for a long time. And she came every week to that synagogue. Why? Because religion makes you comfortable in your circumstances. Every week she came there, sat there. Every week. And these big, long row bishops called Pharisees and scribes stood up there every day, read the scriptures, deep stuff written by Isaiah, and made their commentary from the Torah and the Pentateuch. And they, they, they were so deep. And the woman kept coming there with her sickness. One day the king came in. And they asked the king to read the scripture. That's a rough thing to do because now he ain't going to read it. Now he's going to demonstrate the thing. And he walks up to the podium, reads the scripture, and then the Bible says he fastened his eyes on the woman. The leaders began to get nervous and they said, oh my God, he's going to do something. He, I know he's he going to do something. And it's the wrong day. It's the Sabbath day. He ain't supposed to work on this day. And the Bible says Christ... Knowing their thoughts, they might have been sip, sipping behind them, sip, 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 so he picked up something. He said these words. Now, he, he's about to set the woman up, all right? He said to the whole crowd and to the leaders, he said, Which of you, if your ox fell into the ditch on the Sabbath day, would you not go and get him out? Of course, he saw them do it, so they couldn't answer the question. Now, in those days, an ox was like, uh, was, was like your investment. Because an ox was what the farm was built around. You lose an ox, you can't make any money. The ox was like your, your, your tractor in the farm. That's why you'd go in the ditch on the Sabbath day, get your ox. Because you, you, your, your whole company just fell into the ditch. So you got to understand the thinking here. So he said, well... This woman, and he pointed out, he said, this woman, watch this now, he's going to shift in the kingdom, thinking, is she not a daughter of Abraham? In other words, I don't care how she feel right now, I don't care how she moaning, there's nothing to do with that, nothing to do with moaning. I'm shifting into rights. Is she a daughter of Abraham? Then if she be a daughter of Abraham, watch the words he uses, ought not. Now that is a heavy word. She ought to be free from this infirmity. Lift your right hand. Say this with me. I'm a citizen. I'm a citizen. I ought to be debt free. Be debt -free. See, you don't mean it. See, you put your hand down. Say it again. I ought. Let me tell you something. That hit me last year. And this year I'm debt free. You ain't get it yet, see?
the religious man. I'm telling you, my friends, we ain't got it yet. It happened to me in record time. I still can't explain how it all happened. I'm debt free. I own my house. $600,000 house. Paid for. Own all my cars. Don't own nobody nothing. And the only explanation I got is kingdom. It got to get here. Lift your right hand and say, I ought to be healed. See, if you ask God for healing, you ain't going to get healing. You got to go in there understanding that I have a right to be healed. Come on, say it. I have a right to be. Say it again. I have a right to be wealthy. That's a different idea altogether. She ought to be free from this, he says. God is not supposed to bless you as a favor. No. That's religion, man. And I know it because I used to be in the religion. I was steeped. I was born into a, a, a pastor's family, a preacher's family. I'm a PK. I know I can write books on religion. I know how to keep religion real good. It'll kill you. Nothing is more exciting than the kingdom. Now let me stress something to you. Do you know why Jesus said go into the world and preach the gospel of the kingdom? Do you know why he said go to the world? Because he knows what the world wants. They want power. How come all those unrighteous people love Jesus so much? They're attracted to, to what he was teaching. Power. Matter of fact, it was them who said, no man speak like this man. They said, the Bible says, they loved his words. What, what, what kind of statement is that? They loved his words. In other words, they loved his message. He was promising them power. Could you imagine a, a, a peasant living in Capernaum under the Roman Empire, being forced to pay taxes? He had to carry the Roman soldier's shield, which weighs 70 pounds, one mile by law. I mean, the guy is a victim. Here comes this young guy saying, you know, you can could, you could control your circumstances if you come into this kingdom we got. You want to see you, 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 you want to see why Peter was such a bold man? One kingdom put Peter in jail. Locked him up, put him in chains. The guy had chains on his feet, chains on his hands. Locked in the wall, not cell. Stinking cell, man. And there were soldiers outside the cell, guarding the cell. That's one kingdom. There was a small group in a, in a little room praying to another kingdom. And they said to their government, this government has arrested one of your citizens, O king. And we got a problem with that. So that government sent their soldiers. You all better talk to me. And their soldiers walked right past the other soldiers, boom, kicked open the gate. And without a key that they made, unlocked the chain. And the citizen walked, stepped over the sleeping soldiers, walked out, pressed, not harmed, came to the prayer meeting, knocked on the door. And the people says, government answered that quickly? <laughs> Tell your neighbor, that's my government. You see, God ain't got to meet your need the way you figure it out. It's kingdom power. I said, that's kingdom power. I said, that's kingdom power. I said, that's kingdom power. When they tell you that you, you ain't going to get no more money, listen, that ain't time to panic. That's time to change governments. I rest my case. Yes. Matthew 3, I thought it was interesting. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, quote, say it out loud, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is... Now you never saw that before. That's what John preached. He had the right message. Notice the word near. <laughs> he was in the crowd. The kingdom was in the crowd. John said, I don't know where it is, but it's near. In a couple of days, I'll probably see it, but it's somewhere around here. He said, he said, change your mind because the kingdom is about to come in on us. 
Why change your mind? Because you see, there's only one way to pay a mortgage. That's payment every month for 25 years. That's one way. John said, repent. You all missed it. Man. You all in. You all looking at me funny. That's deep. People say hallelujah just now. Shout. See, you got one way to pay tuition. You got to find money, save it up, or get it from somewhere, or borrow it, and then you pay tuition. God said, no, change your mind. I got a way to pay tuition you ain't never seen. So you can't keep your mind in that old kingdom. Y'all don't understand what I'm talking about. Some of y'all already concluded you need money from the bank. You already concluded that. And God is saying, change your mind. You've already decided there's only one way to get healed. And that is certain medication. God said, change your mind. Everybody say, repent. repent. Hit your neighbor, say, repent. repent. Hit him again, say, repent. There's only one way for a man who was put in prison to come out of prison. And that is you got to go to the local government and you got to appeal to them and ask for his case to be brought up. And then you bring evidence that he wasn't guilty. And then you spend five days in the trial. And then you got to go through all kind of customs, all kind of instruction. Then you got to appeal and appeal and appeal and appeal. And if they decide, they let him go. God said, change your mind. I want you all to meet in the room and pray for five seconds. That's all you got to do. And I'll send some angels there, open the place, take off the cuffs, bring him out. There's another way to get a man out of prison. Amen. John say, it's near. Feed them. There's only one way to feed them. We got to go back into town. That's a three days walk. We got to spend money, buy enough for 5,000 rolls and 5,000 fishes. We got to feed these folks and I can take some cars to bring it back. We need some camels to tote the bread. We need to arrange three days walk so the bread doesn't spoil. We got to work hard and get the food back here. It's a banquet. He said, change your mind. That's the kingdom you live in, man. It's another way to feed 5,000 people. Lift your hand up. Say, Lord, what I'm going through, I have a right to be free. Fix it any way you want. Now praise him for a second. It's kingdom. Stop telling the government how to do its business. It's a different world. Some of you cannot believe that somebody will walk up to you and pay your mortgage off tomorrow morning. You cannot believe that. No, you don't. You, it's hard to believe it because you're religious. It's tough to believe it. Matter of fact, you don't believe anybody can love you that much. And that's where you're mistaken. It ain't got nothing to do with love. It has to do with rights. Man, don't fool with me, man. Oh, hallelujah. You think those birds love Elijah? No, but they were sent to bring the cake. I've had people tell me to my face, you know, I can't stand you. You're so bold and confident, you come over arrogant. But I like what you're doing anyhow. Here's a check for $100,000. You've done that to me. Hey, boys, say, send them angels. <laughs> See, the angels got to send them. They come, they don't know what to come. Here it is. I don't know what it is. Here it, is. it ain't about them. It's about the government sending them to bring it. Kingdom. Kingdom. You all can't take this. I could. Oh, I got 10 minutes. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Look at this one here. Matthew 25. Look at that. It's powerful. It says, Come, you who are blessed of my Father. Take your inheritance. What is inheritance? Rights. What is your rights? The kingdom. Which was prepared for you. How long? Not 2,000 years ago when he died. It was always yours. Before the earth was even made, this was yours. Oh, look at this verse here. It's powerful. 
Matthew 4, 17. From that time forth, Jesus began to preach. What? The kingdom of heaven is near or has arrived. It's, he said, it is in me, but it shall be what? In you. Let me tell you something, friends. He says in Matthew 10, as you go, verse 7, preach this message. What message? The kingdom is near. He told disciples, I don't even trust you about what to preach. I'm going to tell you what to preach. God's visiting us again in this generation. He's saying, look, I'm sick and tired of what you guys are preaching. So I'm going to tell you again what to preach. Preach the kingdom. Yes, sir. We're preaching all kinds of stuff. I've been cleaning out my, my files, just dumping sermons. He said, that's not the, he said, that's not the message. That's not the message. You become what you learn. So if you learn tolerance, you'll tolerate all this garbage you're going through. But if you learn dominion, you'll dominate it. It's that simple. As a man think it. Matthew 13, 18 says, Listen to me then. What the parable of the sower means. Now, this is an important verse. Listen to this carefully, Pastor. Listen. It says, When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. No, you think you read that verse. Read it again. Read it again. Read the verse again. Read it again. That's the most powerful verse I've read for years. The devil is not afraid of your teaching on the blood. You listen carefully. He's not afraid how long you teach on prosperity. You listen to me carefully. He ain't afraid if you teach your people about faith. All the months of teaching on faith, the devil said, Ha, keep teaching. I ain't afraid of none of that teaching. The only one he's afraid of is the one up there, Jesus said. <laughs> yes, I know, Dwight. I can see your face. Isn't that amazing? You never saw it. Eh? Look at that. Right. It messed me up too when I saw it. He said, look, the devil is afraid of one message. He comes to snatch it away. He said, look, I don't care if they believe in healing. That's fine. As long as they don't believe in kingdom. Because see, kingdom gets your healing, but makes you keep it. See, you can get healed and still get sick again. But when you get kingdom, you get it and you keep it. Because now you're dealing with rights. You get it. That's why Satan will fight this message more than any other message. Because this message moves the power out of the pulpit and put it in you. I'm going to say one, one more thing about religion. Write this down. Religion runs on control. Religion gets its satisfaction from controlling the people in it. That is why <laughs> religious people hate this message of the kingdom. The Pharisees enjoyed controlling those people. The Sadducees enjoyed controlling those people. And Christ came and started meddling with their control system. He started telling those peasants and those farmers and those fishermen, if you follow me, I'll give you an influence over men and women and families and children. I'll give influence over demons and devils and sickness and disease. And the, 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 the Pharisees say, wait a minute. Religion likes to control people. Look at the religions of the world. Look at them. Just look at them. Including Christianity. 
It's called mass control, mental control, brainwashing. This ain't about brainwashing what I'm teaching. I'm teaching you how to have your own government. Personal government. Where you have ruling in your heart the king of kings and the lord of lords. And as a citizen, he gives the authority to demand rights from your government to control your environment. That's what I call power. Satan hates that. Luke 12 says this, But seek ye first the kingdom, and these things will be added unto you. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. God wants you to have the kingdom, man. So, what is the kingdom? Characteristic. The word kingdom is the word basilia in the New Testament. And this basilia, it has three meanings. It means sovereignty, royal power, and dominion. This is serious stuff. Christ that came to give you sovereignty, I came to give you royal power, and I came to give you dominion. Well, sounds familiar? Let them have what? Dominion. He said, I came to give it back to you. Last night I showed you the yoke he was carrying, the yoke of the government, and he did what? He took it of him and put it back on you. Why? Because it fits you. You were made for dominion. Do you know why? Listen carefully, brother. A yoke that don't fit the animal kills the animal. So anything other than dominion is killing you. You're not built for worry. That's why Christ said, don't worry, don't worry. Stop worrying. Stop worrying. Why? Worry is torment, the scriptures say. Torment what means what? Irritation until death. That's torment. The word for torment means irritation until death. You irritate your neck until it kills you. For what is kingdom? Is my father good pleasure to give you what? Sovereignty. To give you what? Royal power. To give you what? Dominion. Come on, don't read the Bible like a religious person. Read it properly. He says, it's my father's good pleasure to give you what? Read it. To give you sovereignty. To give you royal power. And to give you dominion. That's kingdom. It is my father's good pleasure to give you what? Sovereignty. No man, this is too deep. Y'all, some of y'all doze. I'm going to stop right now. I got two minutes. So listen good. Some of you believe God is threatened when you say you're sovereign. God gets excited when you start acting sovereign. I'm going to control my circumstances today. God said, boy, you, you're just like your pa. Come on, clap your hands. That's a good place to clap. <laughs> Hallelujah. You say, man... Aren't you afraid of that big situation? He says, no, I'm not afraid. So, oh boy, you, you so, you, what do you think? You think you, you control everything? Yes, I do. And then God says, that's my boy. She's acting just like he daddy. Boy, look at that. Controlling situation. Hey, boy, say, it pleases the Father to give me authority. That's why when Jesus knelt in that, in that, in that river and came out of that water, the Bible says, the Father says, this is my son. I'm pleased with this guy. Why? He speaks to winds and to waves. And he's not afraid to speak to a tree and it dies. He's not afraid to walk on water. The guy is nuts. He's just like his daddy, man. He believes he controls the whole thing. We're victims, man. We're victims and we're and we calling it Christianity. This is kingdom business. Yeah. 60 seconds. All kingdoms are characterized by the following. Number one, a king. Number two, a territory. Number three, a citizenship. Number four, write them down fast, a constitution. Number five, every kingdom must have laws and principles by which it functions. Number six, every kingdom must have a government. That means the ruling authority system. Number seven, every kingdom has privileges. That means rights and benefits. And number eight, every kingdom has code of ethics. That means there are precepts by which you must live, conduct yourself. I call them moral codes. Every kingdom got these things. You can't wait to get one. And every kingdom has this important issue. It has an army. We're going to deal with that later on in the week. Because the army is, 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 is the sweet part. <laughs> Write these characteristics down, please. And I'm trying to teach you now why the devil don't want you to learn about this. Write it down. Every kingdom has the characteristics of what? 
First, it has an economy. Secondly, it has an army. Thirdly, it has authority. Like every other kingdom has an authority. Fourthly, every kingdom has communication systems. Fifth, every kingdom has educational system. Sixth, every kingdom has health programs. Seven, every kingdom has ambassadors. Eight, every kingdom has security systems. I love this one. Woo, don't, I wish you learned that one before you leave. Number nine, every kingdom has a commonwealth, of, a commonwealth system where the, the, the wealth is distributed equally among the citizens. Number ten, every kingdom has a social life. Number eleven, every kingdom has a culture. Number twelve, every kingdom has a purpose for existence. And number thirteen, every kingdom has an ideology. This list will blow your mind. Please write them down. That's the characteristics of the kingdom. Every kingdom you study has these elements in it. Which means that in the kingdom of God, you've got to study and learn these elements in your own kingdom. I'll give you a brief example. Number one, every kingdom has an army. Let me show you how getting revelation can change your life. You, know, you couldn't take that anyhow. I don't know if you could take that. You ain't ready for that. You think y'all could take that? I want to close on this. You think you take a little piece of it? A little piece? You sure? Everybody say citizenship. Now, every kingdom has citizenship. Let me ask you a question. In, a, in your country, in your kingdom, you are a citizen. Who's the army? And that's where you're wrong. All right. You're about to get revelation. See, here's what's, what's wrong. The church has been claiming things it's not. I'm going to ask the question again. If you are a citizen, who's the army? Yeah. Well, I'm talking about your, your country. The army is a group of people who are no longer citizens. You all ain't listening to me. Shake it. Look at me. These five seconds are going to change your life. When a person joins the army or the navy or the marines, they are no longer citizens. Okay, let me explain it to you. Explain it to you. <laughs> they distinguish anyone in the military with these terms. He's not a civilian. You all miss it? Because the person in the army <laughs> protects the citizens, fights for the citizens, defends the citizens, serves the citizens, and does what the citizens want. They become the servant of the citizens. Citizens, write it down, do not fight. You stay with me for a second. Citizens are not the army. Ron, Ronnie Wexler, you, you understand. You used to be in the army, right? You know, when you're in the army, you wasn't a citizen. You couldn't do what you feel like. You, would, you did what the government told you to do. Are you listening to me? That's all. The devil don't want you to get this. Remember now, he hates the kingdom message, so he's going to steal it from you. He can make you dive and sleep. Listen carefully. A citizen simply enjoys life. When your army is out fighting, what are you doing? You're playing golf. Right. You're drinking a nice tall glass of lemonade. You're watching TV. And, you, and sometimes they show you them on TV. They show you on TV, CNN, and they're fighting. What are you doing? you drinking Coke while you're watching them fight. Something's wrong with that. <laughs> Citizens don't fight. So who is the army in the kingdom of God? It can't be you. You're the citizen. So now you have to go back and read your Bible all over again. The army is the angels. Shh, I'm about to destroy religion again. That means never again should you ever say we are the army of the Lord. It's not in scripture anywhere. It's in your religion. And that's why you're tired. And that's why you're sick. 
And that's why you're frustrated because you're fighting, man. You're fighting stuff you ain't supposed to fight. Go preach the right gospel to the people in the islands. Preach the right gospel to India, man. Go and repent. Change your, your message. It's the kingdom. What are we doing? They say, well, well we're we, we going to have a prayer meeting and we're going to do warfare. Warfare? What are you talking about? Now, I know I'm going to get in trouble for this, but prove it to me in scripture. That's religion. Let me tell you what, what citizens do. I'm already closed. You can check that tape up. Listen, let me tell you what citizens do. Listen, listen. Listen to me. The police in your country are military. The Navy, military. When you have a problem, someone breaks into your house or does something that assaults you, what do you do? What's the power a citizen has? The citizen picks up the telephone and calls the government and say, look, I got some problems here and I need the soldiers now. Now watch this. Listen. No, no. Shh, listen. Don't get excited. Here. Listen. They don't come. They don't come. When you call the police, they don't come. This is amazing to me. You ever wonder why the police has on the top of its car a siren and lights? Why? They don't just want to come to you. Lord have mercy. They don't want to just get there. They want to get there without hindrance. So they put on this. You make them put on their siren. You make them put the lights on. And they tell everybody, move out of the way. Why? Fletcher just called. You're looking at me funny, man. Excuse me and bless myself. They don't just want to get to you. They want to get to you fast. And when they arrive, here's their first question. What's your problem? Some of y'all didn't get it yet. Daniel had a problem. Daniel said, I got some situation here. I don't like the circumstances I'm in right now. It's a bad situation. So Daniel picked up the telephone and called the government. He's a citizen. And he told the government, I need some situations changed down here. Immediately. The government sent the secret service with the answer on the way down the angel ran into traffic and he couldn't get through to the citizen and so he called the commissioner of police Michael Michael said what's the problem he says they're blocking traffic and Michael says tch, 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 tch. it was Michael fighting Daniel was just waiting on the answer. Just waiting on the answer. It took 21 days. Daniel never fought. Because citizens don't. Don't scream yet. And when the angel arrived, just like any police, the angel says, I have come because of your word. Tell your neighbor, I got, power I got power with the government. Close your Bibles, clap your hands, and praise God. Thank you once again for listening to this message, as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.